Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Dial the Gates, episode 115. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much uh, for joining. We have Tom Macbeth, Colonel Mayborn. Damn it, Harry. <laughs> Returning for uh, the second episode uh, today. So we're going to be bringing him in in just one moment here. But before we really get going with this show, if you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal to me if you click that like button. It will make a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will continue to help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click that subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops, and you'll get my notifications of any last-minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few weeks on the GateWorld.net YouTube channels, and uh, later on on uh, the Dial the Gate channel uh, when we are in our off-season. As this is a live episode, if you are tuned in to YouTube.com slash Dial the Gate, our moderating team, uh, led by Summer and Tracy and uh, uh, my uh, producer, Linda, and I believe we have Reese as well in there today. They are all standing by to take uh, your questions and get them uh, turned over to me so that I can invite them to Tom. So not every submission is guaranteed to ask to the guest, but uh, we do our best. And without further ado, Mr. Tom Macbeth, Harry Mayborn, thank you for returning once again, sir. It's good to see you. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, right. There's somebody warming up their motorcycle outside, so if, uh, I hope it doesn't interrupt too much. I can't hear them. So oh, good. It is, it is all good. Are you guys, uh, is it chilly up there right now? Are you guys having a warmer winter, or what's, what's well, going we on that, in, in, in the great white north? Um, well, ours is, the, ours is the great white south Ah, in, in Canada. Oh, so. We're, okay. we're the south coast. Southwest. Ah, I didn't even think of it <laughs> yeah. that way. So you, you would, yeah, okay. So we're just above Seattle. So we've been doing what Seattle's been doing. We had some snow and some cold. And, um, um, you know, we're only two hours from Seattle. So, um, or not even that if you drive fast. Um, <laughs> but we did have, we did have, uh, we actually had people making their own skating rinks in their backyards, which is something they do in the prairies. Uh, and I'm sure they do it in the States as well during the winter. And you can get out and practice your hockey in the backyard. Um, so we've had that, but we're back to sort of normal stuff, except we're coming up to this thing that they, that we're getting this, um, warm thing coming up from, uh, from the South, from, um, Hawaii sweeping in, but it's, a uh, it's a, quite a high, a high ridge and there's enough cool air coming in beneath it from our mountains and stuff coming in from the North that, um, it's going to sit on top of the cold stuff and the cold stuff will then turn into fog. So we'll have 300 feet of fog. Oh. We'll have, we'll have sun on top of it. They think for a couple of weeks coming up. See, it's a, it's a really sad time. It happens every few years. Uh, and you, and all you have to do is drive up on the North shore and get above the clouds. And you see the top of skyscrapers and stuff and apartment buildings. Uh, in this sea of cloud and you're up there in the beautiful warm sun it's very odd it would say to me i mean that sounds just gorgeous to me yeah as like as a <laughs> as an amateur photographer it's like oh i want to get me some of that in my lens but we're so, down here in the dark and the oh uh, that's true uh, and it's uh, and it's only 300 feet up if you're in a high rise uh you're fine <laughs> so it sits it like <laughs> yeah because a, a fog is just there. cloud that lacks the will to fly yeah, so, geez. so that's what we're looking forward to in the next couple of weeks, they say. Did you play uh, Ebenezer this past year or did you take a break no. this year? No, no, the last two years, no. The year before in 2020, uh, you did a, an online version, I believe. Uh, yeah, we did a we did a reading version of it, yes. Yeah. How was that different from uh, the version that you did uh, uh, perform live? Was it just pieces of it? How how was that different? How was preparing for it different? What were the challenges involved in, in bringing that version of A Christmas Carol to uh, online? Well, of course, we didn't do any much rehearsal. I think we did a sort of a, a get together the day before. Mm. Uh, and there was a couple of people that couldn't make it, so other actors were involved. Um, um, so we, uh, we had a new... Uh, the new ghosts, uh, mm. uh, um, an actor from Toronto that I've worked with for many years, uh, on and off. Um, 
well, many years ago, I guess. So John Jarvis. So he was lots of fun. Um, and it was getting to reconnect with people. But we didn't, um, although we sort of, the lines are in the, your background, we're doing yeah. it off of, um, we're doing it off the script. Um, so it, it's different that way. So you still try and, and grab into, grab into where you thought you were and, uh, but still trying to stay immediate and listening to the faces that you see on the screen. Um, so it was, it was just a different way of going about it, but it was, it was really nice to get back in touch with it. So, yeah. Is it one of those where it's like, you know, this was, this was satisfactory for this time. You know, I, I would be willing to do this again. Or was it, was it detached enough from the material where it was like, you know what, I'm, I'd rather not do it in this format again. You know, how, how did you feel after that? Um, well, I think I, I, I had a sense before we even started. I thought, wow, this is going to be fun because I haven't mm. seen a lot of this cast for a long time. And uh, so a lot of them live over in Victoria. Um, and it's always nice to get back in touch with that. But it's not something I, I would want to do weekly. <laughs> yeah, and that's I, true. And I don't get involved in, I haven't been involved in any of the theater stuff that's been going on here in town. I've not watched any of it on zoom or mm. whatever uh, i just i just go well it's not it's not theater <laughs> so, um, theater is participatory you know you have an audience yeah, reaction even if it's just transfixed yeah. silence well even when you're sitting in the audience you're a part of your 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 you know you're you're also reacting to the audience around you as well as what you're seeing in front of you so mm. it's just a different experience um i like and i like that one better than I think that there there is no um, it, he Ebenezer is perhaps I would argue the most important literary character in in all of fiction, um, and you know I I love talking to him uh, talk, talking with you about him because you've you've sunk so much of yourself into that role when you when you do the performance. And, you know, you've you've had the chance to evolve it over a decade. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, what were the pivot points for you that defined for Ebenezer when you're portraying that character, when he truly looked back on his life and realized he almost completely wasted it? So, uh, so I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Um, is it just a course of through the entire play that it's bit by bit by bit by bit? He's seeing, you know what, I've, I've, my, my, the perspective on my life has been wrong. Or are there specific moments in that story where he gets, he gets hit by a truck basically and has to reassess and assess? Well, I, well, I think right from the beginning, the, like the first time he leaves the leaves the bedroom with the ghost, and off they fly, and and they end up first at the school, at least in the play, the version that we do, he ends up at his old school, and he's hit, he's hit immediately. Um, how 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 difficult it was for him, but then he fights it all back. He just goes, no, no, I can't deal with that. That's emotional stuff. I can't deal with that. Get up, that. and he keeps trying. So and as he journeys through. Um, the things come at him and, and they, they hit him, but he pushes them all away saying, no, this is not me. That this is, uh, I, this is a, the bad road to go on this. If I, if I let myself embrace all this, um, I'm in, I'm in big trouble. I think ultimately the one that really cracks is, um, is, um, uh, is is the the death of Tiny Tim um, in the that future that, that happens? Yeah, in the future, and then um, and then and then his own death, realizing that if that happens, um, I think that's what pushes him to say no, no. I think I'm ready to go back. I think I'm ready to um, to face all this stuff, to accept it, to. Um, and then the fact that he that that he realizes that uh, he is still alive, um, <laughs> he immediately starts to work on stuff. 
Um, so getting the turkey off to the Cratchits to, um, to try and stop the future from happening or to change the future. Um, so I, th I, I think it is the death of Tiny Tim in the future and then his own death when he's supposed to go and open the coffin, when the, when the ghost wants him to open the coffin. And he can't because he knows it's him. Um, so it's, it's, it's in there that, um, that he, um, that all the things he's experienced over the, over the evening, <laughs> which he thinks mm -hmm. is much longer than an evening. Um, all, all of those things he's willing, uh, he's willing to accept now. He's willing to accept the poorness of the Cratchits. He's willing to accept the terrible mistake he made with them. Um, with the, women, with the woman in his life, um, uh, seeing how happy she is with her family and children and all these things that he's missed. Um, um, I mean, he has such a great time when he, when he goes back to um, the place where he worked. Uh, come on, Tom, you can grab this. Um, um, cra um, oh, it doesn't matter. Anyways, Fezzy wigs. The, Fezzy wigs. The, how much fun he had there, how much joy he had there. Uh, where he met this woman and and then how he just pushed it all aside and just said, no, this is, uh, um, you know, the remembrance of of how wonderful Fezziwig was, how open and helpful and uh, positive, which he had somehow, he'd lost it. Uh, he experiences that at the time, but then he's got to push it away and go, no, no, I can't do this. I, I can't deal with that. I, this is not my life. My life is this. It's it's got a, to do with money. It's got to getting. It's uh, the future is piling up those shackles as much as fast as you can. It's interesting because you see, um, the darkness uh, that that character was surrounded by, especially being left at school for years and years. His dad mistreating him, um, and then as an adult, he had an opportunity to to find joy. But his goals were simply different, so, despite the fact that he was surrounded by, you know, the best people that he mm -hmm. could be surrounded by, given the the circumstances of that time and everything else. Fezziwig, you know, with Bell, you know, he had it made, but his goals were still, he wasn't seeing what was right in front of him. And, you know, it it, it takes it takes an encounter in old age with a with a a a. a a metaphysical presence to clock him upside the head and say, you've got one last chance here. You know, you're going to, you're going to go for it or are you going to, you know, let this poor child and this family and, and God knows who else out there uh, suffer and sacrifice when you could have done something about it. I think well, it's, it's a great it's, redemptive story. Well, it, it's really interesting because it, it, it where, wherever the, wherever the dreams come, where, wherever the ghosts come from, they're in his, they're somewhere in his own head and it's, and it, the, the, the little flame has been lit, the little candlelight has been lit in the office before he leaves with Cratchit. Before he tells Cratchit, you be here, yeah, okay, come in, but be here. You, you can take the morning off, um, but get in here. Like um, All the earlier, yeah. All, where where he's, uh, he's really being ugly to, to Cratchit. And, um, but somewhere in there, if, if, the, if the ghosts are real, that's one thing, but if they're all in his head, all that stuff is there and he experiences it all. But it, that might have been the, the little spark that starts it. Um, his guilt about being a shit to, to crack it. <laughs> this is true. I wanted to, uh, to have you share a story that um, uh, was a part of the, uh, the interview that we did for Dialing Home that got canceled in that season two, along with all the other interviews that, uh, that we, that, uh, we did oh, for Stargate command. Uh, we were talking about, um, missed opportunities and, uh, how you, um, you know, not everything, uh, works out the way that you think that it's going to. And sometimes these, these things just don't materialize. And you had mentioned Jumanji. And this, I thought, was a fascinating example of where you think you've got this thing and then all of a sudden plans change. Can you share that story if you don't mind? Um, well, I know I, the, 
the script that I went in and auditioned with was. And this is the Robin Williams version, just so everybody knows. Yeah. So and, this is a while ago. Yeah. And um, I was the guy that I, I think I was a plumber mm -hmm. and I was coming in to fix something. And we ended up up, up in the attic looking at whatever was going on there with the two little kids. And he tells them a story and scares the living daylights out of them. And I, you know, I really do like storytelling. So, so, and the script was really good. I don't know if they, I, I don't think, I don't know if it was in the book or what it was mm. anyways. Um, I had actually had gone out to one of the used uh, workplaces uh, that just sells stuff on Kingsway here in Vancouver um, that sells old tools. And, and I, I got myself a pair of um, uh, overalls, mm. uh, used overalls. So I wore the overalls and for the audition and I ended up getting the part. So at the, at the same time, my buddy who, uh, we go way back, both getting out of, out of theater school, him from the U, from UBC, me from the Vancouver Playhouse, him as a director. We, we sort of did our first, well, it wasn't exactly our first shows together, but it was very close to being our first shows together. And I've worked with John Cooper many times since. He's my favorite director, a stage director. And um, he had asked me to do this play in, in Edmonton. And it, it conflicted with this part, uh, this Jumanji one day part, but a great, great, mm -hmm. great scene. And um, the year before he had asked me to do a piece and I had said no because I had booked some TV stuff. And so this time I thought, oh, I can't say no to him again. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't, we, we go back too far. And it was a really interesting part that in this small little tiny play called, um, oh gosh, what was it called? It doesn't matter. Um, and it was a little th three person, three person play in Edmonton. And it, it was really quite delightful, dark as hell, uh, French Canadian piece that had been translated, beautiful translation. Uh -huh. okay. So I went and did that. And then somebody else got cast. And of course, when the movie came out, it had been totally rewritten and the little story didn't take place at all. And he, the, he didn't get it. The, the character didn't scare the shit out of the kids. He came in and he did a little bit of business and then he left. Now, I don't know whether they had filmed the scene and then cut it uh, to, to bring it into time and however they do that kind of stuff, editing and stuff. But it was just a, basically a nothing part. So <laughs> it worked out just fine. So I don't know. Is that is that the same story? You're yes, it is. Okay. Exactly. So... I had a great time in Edmonton and I always thought, Oh my God, I should have, I should have uh, done that. I should have done that. And maybe it would have changed my career. Who knows? But um, the result that came out on screen was uh, nothing to talk about. So yeah, a shadow of what it is that had been yeah. on the page. How yeah. often do you find that to be the case uh, when you've worked on uh, film and television um, where things that are just delicious on the page get cut? For, for whatever reason. I mean, is this is this the biggest example of that? Um, well, I, yeah, things change all the time. Yeah. You know, uh, by the time you get to shoot, you've been through uh, eight rewrites, eight different colored pages, sets of pages from salmon to, to lemon to <laughs> whatever, blue sky, dark blue. Um, and, and then sometimes, I don't know, I think there might be 12 colors and then they start them over again. <laughs> So it's, it's lemon yellow too. Uh, <laughs> so lots of things change as you go along um, and it just becomes part of it. And you don't, uh, I don't think I put a lot of value on, on what gets changed. Uh, maybe I did early on, but I don't, I haven't, well, I don't do enough work anymore to actually worry about that stuff. So. <laughs> do you have, um, ha have you been auditioning or are, uh, are you hunkering down still? Uh, no, um, uh, I have one. Uh, I have a neat little one coming up on. Um, I have to have it in by Tuesday here at home. We, it's all self auditions. Uh, it's for um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Reginald the Vampire. So, uh, let's see. Um, 
so and it's a neat little character uh, and you could go probably go a thousand different ways for it so i'll pick my way and go from there you don't get a chance to talk to a director and say could you do it could you change could you you know uh not unless they are interested and then they have you back uh, with okay. notes and you send in another one and then they can do a zoom with you and a few others they're interested in so Ah, oh, okay. So under those circumstances, then those doors yeah. open. Now through the through the COVID thing, we've done a lot of at home stuff here. We can I can now set it up and take it down in like I, I can have everything set up in like five minutes and take it down in five minutes. And then it's uh compressing it so that you can send it through, mm-hmm. you know, and all that kind of stuff that takes that takes all the time. Um, but we got that down pretty well as well. So both Karen and I we're in the biz, so we do a mm-hmm. lot of it here. Um no, it was, um, it was uh, like, I, I, I also have this um, very semi recurring part on Riverdale, um, Smithers. And um, so last spring, last spring, I think I did three episodes, but it was each of them were one day. And it was like two lines each day, so maybe only one line. Uh, but they, you know, it's a, it's a nice contract. And, but at that time with all the COVID tests you had, and because we work up here in Vancouver on, uh, on our kind of contracts, we get what you call a buyout. So we get, we get our, uh, we get our amount of, you know, our little nut and they buy it out. They buy us for five years and they don't have to pay any royalties on it. But they they pay they pay you another hundred and ten percent or a hundred and fifteen percent for those five years, so that sort of doubles your nut. But you also had to have two COVID tests before you went, and at that time they were paying you a day's wage to go get a COVID test. So, so you were getting like four days pay for one day's work, and sometimes it was two lines. You know? <laughs> so you just shake your head about, oh, what's going to happen? They're covering their bases. Times. Yeah, while well, they're covering their bases, and all of a sudden, you know, there's there's money coming in where I never thought there would be any, and I don't really care if any comes in or much comes in either because it's I'm uh, I got I have to I have to take money out of my RRSPs or what do you guys call them your K K whatever <laughs> your yeah retirement that... stuff. <laughs> exactly yeah social security so, and so yeah so you know there's enough money coming in from there so um i had a, i had a, a good run in this business and and, and fortunately uh, never touched any of the rsp money but as well as that i auditioned for a little movie that was a netflix thing uh, or that they shot over in victoria uh called rescued by ruby um and uh just had a great time over there um with a really neat little character uh, so there was 10 days work over there. And then I did a, an episode of um, family law as well with a, an old um, director friend of mine and a Stargate, um, Stargate uh, fella, um, Andy Makita. Ah, good old Andy. Who's a producer, a producer for family, uh, family, uh, family, um, family law. And uh, he also directed this episode. So, uh, so the, my springtime was just, I was just loaded with work and, um, those can, and except though know, the, the, the movie and, and, uh, the family law thing came from, um, from auditions. So, um, okay. yeah, so, and so we're still doing auditions. Um, so and, uh, rescued really, by Ruby, it is, um, it looks like, uh, is she an adoptee? I think she's a pup. Uh, well, she's a she's a dog that uh, they've had in the SBCA Got that it. Uh, that they can't uh, that people have taken out because it's so, such a wonderful dog. But then it's just a terrible dog when it gets home. It right. just ruins just ruins the house. <laughs> and the 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 star of the piece, um, uh, Grant Gustin. Yes, Dan. Uh, who yeah, who plays uh, Flash? Um, yep. Uh, he was just absolutely wonderful, and he's the he wants to be on the dog, the canine team for the police, and he's a already a policeman, but he wants to work his way into the dog team. And the guy that runs the dog team 
says no, 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 and then he but he brings his own do- so then he brings his own dog and the and it's a story about how the dog disappoints him and then how he disappoints the dog and all this kind of stuff. It's quite wonderful, and it's based on a true story. Um, uh, it's directed by uh, Kat Shea. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, and she was wonderful to work with as well. Uh, it, she was lots of fun. Um, a Stargate Karen, Atlantis alum, uh, Sharon Taylor, is in this too. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyways, the dog, uh, based on a true story, uh, two years into this dog actually being accepted on the canine unit with, uh, with Dan, uh, the dog wins the best canine in America. Uh, based on a true story. So, oh, maybe I shouldn't be saying all this to all these people. It's well, I mean, story, you know, if, if it's a true story, they can they can find that information out, certainly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Expo expected uh, this year. So it's a Netflix. Yeah, uh, they think uh, February or March sometime, I think. Okay. Well, we're going to yeah. have to keep an eye out for that. That's really cool. You so, know, you know, there, there's a lot. There's, there, Vancouver has been busier uh, since COVID than any time before. Hmm. Everything is booked up. Every space, every it's amazing yeah it's been it's been quite extraordinary trying to uh book uh interviews for this show um i really should have started earlier in the pandemic <laughs> frankly because everyone's been uh crazy amanda you know tapping it's busier than ever and on one hand it's like i really want to have her on and on the other hand it's like i can't falter you know it's it's <laughs> terrific go go amanda you know um, this is this is good stuff indeed, and you got you got to be thankful for the work and thankful that there you, you can get involved in 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 light stories that that make you feel good. You know that yeah. there's there's not just a bunch of Debbie Downer content that's always being created, even though there is. You know there's there's stories like these that that lift your heart and give you strength of spirit. And it's like you know what I can go on another day. Well, I know a Hallmark Christmas Hallmark does that for a lot of people, but it does just the opposite for me. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> oh god! <laughs> Jeez! Uh, oh man! Uh, I have um, some questions here uh, uh, from fans, and I wanted to also ask you about. Um, working with the uh, the team on Stargate to create that character over over the years that you did with Brad Wright, with Rob Cooper, um, just just watching him evolve from this megalomaniacal mastermind, you know, who uh, was was uh, trying to save the planet on his on his own ends to becoming king of a small population of people who truly loved this man. Uh, what a journey uh, over eight years. And, you know, it's it's got to be it's got to be uh, a, a, a privilege to have played him. Uh, it was it was a great learning curve for me. I mean, you know, I, I don't the only credit I can take for the development of the character was to try and and take the episode that was in front of me and try and make sense of it because each one I went no this isn't the character this isn't the last character I played and and then I but I jumped in there and and then the next time it would be well Collie this is this is a uh, what do, what do I do with this guy now um, so he it he just became more dimensional as they wrote them. So it's the writers who, uh, uh, the writers who put that together. And, and, um, uh, and the only credit I can take for uh, where the character developed was, I guess I managed to, to satisfy each sort of growth episode for the character. So, uh, absolutely. Um, and it would, I, I, I think, uh, like I think I said this before, for me he was always a bit problematic for me as a military man, because mm-hmm. um, I've never thought of myself as a, as the straight-shouldered sort of um, uh, stick in the mud kind of guy. Um, <laughs> um, and and so once I once I was able to lose the um, the military costume, 
uh, the character really started to change a lot. Uh, so, well, I think that's where that's where I started to get really comfortable. He was um, no longer supposedly bound by those um, rules and regulations. You didn't really know where he was coming from. You didn't know if he was going to stab you in the back or if he was going to save your life. And, yeah. you know, I think that there is a... Uh, there, There's just an aspect of that that is absolutely delicious to watch on screen. You know, because it's like, where is he going to go? We don't know. We're going to have to watch yeah. and find out. You can't peg him, you know. And yeah. there are, the, the, frankly, you know, in Stargate, there's a lot of there's a lot of defined parameters. There is good, there is evil, but not with Mayborn. And I think that's one of the reasons that fans find him so delicious. Well, I certainly, I I really enjoyed him, um, and it, and it was uh, whatever. I you know, I don't know the episode numbers or anything, mm -hmm. but. Uh, when they when they uh, found him frozen, frozen uh, Watergate, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, Watergate. And um, when I came out of that and and was in prison, and when he, you know, sentenced to hang, when yeah. when he comes to get information from me, that's when one could one. That's I remember. That's when we actually started to play. You know, it was it became play then. I didn't have to stick with what I thought I should do as a military guy. Um, there was a sort of a personal, a personal point to it rather than a professional point. Was Maybe there yeah. a relaxation uh, with Rick on set? Not that like the relax, like, like uh, the work wasn't getting done. Obviously the work was getting done and it was great, but was there a more, um, uh, what, what kind of a set, because he was a producer as well as just an actor, you know, he was an executive producer of the show. What kind of a set did he engender? Well, it, it was always great coming there. Um, every That whole cast was uh, really quite lovely and quite lovely. They were lovely. They, I, they just, from day one, they welcomed me like I was part of the family. And whenever I come back, they came back, they seemed to be really excited so, and, and like open arms. Oh, God, we're back. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, now, RDA is not quite that effusive, but he Correct. was, he was, uh, he, he was, he was great to be on set with because it was always, uh, because he was always at the same time entertaining himself. He was always, <laughs> he was always enjoying himself until they said, uh, then I found out that maybe it was, well, as, as things progressed over the years, maybe he wasn't enjoying himself as much, but, um, uh, he was always respectful. He was, he was always a little on the challenging side. Um, uh, you know, they'd, they'd say, uh, rolling and he'd still be goofing off like hell. And then, <laughs> and then suddenly you were there uh, and you were, the, the, you were shooting the scene and it sort of forced one to, to relax and just go, well, what it's going to be, it's going to be, um, uh, you can't sort of well uh, you work your ass off on your own on these parts and then you get there and of course you don't know where the camera is going to be you don't know how they're going to block it so you have a little fast little thing going on and then away they go and they shoot it and it's, it's often it's nothing the way you imagined it or all the alternatives you were thinking about and then and then you get uh stuff coming from Richard Dean that is absolutely unexpected. Not on the and, script, on the page at all. Well, it can be on the page as okay. well, but, but it's coming at you in a way that you never expected. And, and, and I think that's, an, uh, see, he might've been, he might've been teaching me. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, like, uh, come on, get that, get that plug out of your ass and let's just play, you know, you, you know, uh, now I'm not sure he never said anything like that, but um, it, it really did. Over the years, it did teach me how to relax when you get on set. Now it's really tough if you haven't been on on a set for a while. Like the first two days, you're just nervous as hell because uh, you don't want to make a mistake. Um, I think I'm getting old enough now that I can make a mistake and laugh about it. And mm -hmm. hopefully everybody else will laugh as well. <laughs> <laughs> but you're always, you're always frightened that someone's going to scream at you. 
Um, because that can that has been known to happen. Time I've is money. It happen. <laughs> it's not necessarily screamed at me, but I've been on sets where there's been some screaming. Yeah. <laughs> I I th- I think the thing with Richard Dean is that you 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 can expect uh from from and this is just I'm just delineating what everyone has said about him. Um, you can expect professionalism. You can expect the work to get done. But you can also expect a heck of a lot of spontaneity. Uh, that makes the work uh, not only uh, enjoyable on the set, but also enjoyable to watch. And we yeah. as fans are sitting there going, yeah. was that an ad lib? That feels like that was not meant to be there. And then your reaction to that is kind of like, you know, like like you're reacting, at like almost like he's saying something and going, what do you think of that? You know, let's yeah. see a tap dance of that. <laughs> you know, no. Yeah, I, I think he did when he and when he would ad lib. It was it was um, take that. What are you going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And I think he loved the look on my face when I. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> That's also Mayborn. You know, he's assessing yeah. the situation. Yeah. You, you never know how he's going to handle it. I have uh, 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 some questions from fans. Sure. Um, Tom. Uh, you know, looking looking back, uh, what were uh, what was perhaps a, a, f- a favorite moment that you had from uh, production uh, with Richard, with Amanda, with you know, with with this cast? Most of your work was with Rick. Um, what what was what was really a, f- a favorite scene uh, to make? Elizabeth Lee wants to know. Um, Uh, my 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 favorite one with Rick was uh, when we were, um, uh, gosh, whatever the name of the, the episode was, where we're uh, where we're eating the grass stuff and we turn into uh, crazy people <laughs> and start shooting each other. Um, there was the the scene where he's down fishing. Yes. And uh, I come down and ask how he's doing, and he says, "Well, he's got a nibble. He's got a nibble, but hasn't caught anything." And I reach into my pocket and pull out some plastic explosive and just throw it into the water, and <laughs> it explodes, and all these fish float to the tar- top. And that's you know, just that's wrong also, on so many levels. It was all scripted, and then I'm <laughs> then I'm supposed to go in and get the fish and and start to bring them back. Uh, and my favorite, because it it was me getting a chance to to do something he wasn't expecting was I got out there and by this time I'm, I'm fe- feeling quite comfortable on a set with Richard so I get out there to get the fish and I'm walking I guess I'm I don't I think I'm way about waist deep I'm uh-huh. picking up these floating fish and I just start to throw the fish at him <laughs> rather than picking them up and gathering them and bringing them back and him ducking ducking the fish. <laughs> um, and then but one of my favorites and I th- and it, it was the same episode uh, or the one following Watergate where um, uh, we're at uh, Bobby Cox house playing. He's playing the Senator. Yes. Ronnie Cox. Yeah. And um, Ronnie Cox. Yes. And um, it's the end of that scene where he's gotten me out of jail to help him do this thing. And then somehow I've disappeared and he gets a phone call and it's from me and you can hear <laughs> me, up, me on the other end of the phone. And we've taken English Bay down here and they've put, they've put up some fake palm trees and they've uh, hired uh, all these extras, all the, all the dark black extras they can find. Um, and, they ask him to dress in sort of a, uh, a Jamaican kind of way. And they've got a Jamaican drum band down on the beach playing. And I'm on a phone up, up at the top of the, up at the hill uh, above the beach. And I'm talking to him and saying, uh, you know, thank you. Uh, uh, we'll see you. Everything's fine. And I'm wearing a big straw hat. Uh, I've got sh- Bermuda shorts on with socks, the high white socks. <laughs> and the sandals and a Hawaiian shirt. And I hang up and I walk down the beach and I'm just supposed to walk down to the, it's a, I, I think the, the last shot of the, of the episode uh-huh. I'm supposed to walk down to the beach towards the drum set. And I, I don't know, I get about 20 feet down from the camera and this girl crosses my path. So I just grab her and start to dance with her. 
and, and we dance all the way down to the to the drum band to the steel drum band and when they find and it, it, no one said cut so we just kept going and going and going and finally they said cut and then and everybody just went a little crazy they thought it was just quite lovely so i, I it's it's one of those things where you say well god i i never planned anything like that um i was brave enough to do it and it wasn't scripted <laughs> And it worked. <laughs> it's the spirit of the character in that moment, though. I mean, yeah. he's oh, yeah. just he's he's been snatched from the jaws of death, yeah. and you know he's he's happy. <laughs> so it was, so there are little sort of little hallmarks for me about my growth as an actor in that business, in this business, um, and that freedom to do that kind of stuff that is still. Um, still part of the script mm -hmm. and uh and acceptable and um and it's actually the kind some of the stuff that they kind of look for uh, mm -hmm. off the scripted page yeah there so. is a scene with you and rick and uh you had mentioned this once uh, a long time ago um that th th o'neill always thought that he had mayborn's number you yeah. know that he had him under his thumb and there is a scene where um, O'Neill goes to Mayborn and says, you know, Simmons says you're the, his his ex, his former uh, partner in the NID. Simmons says you're the traitor and you whirl on him and you yeah. come right back to him and says, do you believe that? And it yeah. just it brings O'Neill just O'Neill's stunned. He's like, I'm not used to getting this response from this character yeah. or this person. He must really mean this. There's there's some conviction in what I just said to him to make him respond to me that the way he is now. Yeah. Well, the the scene starts with him with me uh, appearing from nowhere at the gas station as yes. he comes yeah. out of the store and and he's pissed off at me and he starts chasing me <laughs> around the truck around the truck and I'm afraid of him. You know, I'm yeah. I'm trying to stay away from him. And then we sort of get into the quiet the conversation part of it and then I walk away and he says that to me. And it's when I come back straight at him, which is the tables are turned now. Like, uh, I'm actually not afraid of you. Um, you know, <laughs> um, and 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 uh, what I've said to you so far, I mean it. It's it's the truth, and I do it. I I I do have a sense of um, kinship with you somewhere within me. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, Noah, that was a nice one too. Yeah. What is it about playing uh, redemptive characters that's so rewarding? From Scrooge to Mayborn. Um... Well, I, I don't think... Uh, let's see. <laughs> is it a hope for humanity? Well, no. For me, for me, when you get involved in characters like that, that... Um, and especially like in the theater, I played a lot of really um, heavy dudes. Uh -huh. um, um, and I guess I, I suppose I have a, a, on TV too. Um, but it's it's trying to get people uh, to understand what's going on in his head, in the character's head, that makes them think. Oh my God! I've thought that. Oh, I'm bad. I'm a bad person too, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so. I, I I think when I started with the character, it's to try to say he he does have a point of view in the world, and it's a good one. Now, they're sort of making me one dimensional here, um, but then as it progressed, um, the, just to find that his levels of desperateness, his uh, his levels of commitment um like off the bat he was very um off the bat he was very rude to all of them mm -hmm. but even before he left the service uh he could be in the same room with them now mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of respect for him but he could be in the room with them and he could say something and he could take something back from him from them and consider it um, so even then he was starting to, 
he was starting to shift now, and that, soften a little. Uh, yeah. Now that was the writers also doing it, but was also letting the audience somewhere into his head. Um, that what you saw earlier wasn't the whole man, and you're starting to start, starting to see inside of his head now. So, like you have been somewhere yourself, uh, and you've been hard edged and straight at somebody. People now have that vision of you, and then you, when you run into them again, you you realize, oh, um, I I I should show another side of me here if we're going if we're going to have to work together. I, I don't know. That's just that sounds it's, right it's, to me. It's you... more that kind of stuff than uh, finding redemptive qualities. It's to find the human quality. There, yes, there is uh, a, an episode in in season three called uh, Foothold, and Carter has come to you yeah. uh, because there's no one else. <laughs> and it's one of those situations where it's like, you know, when when we're at rock bottom, can we trust someone? That under nor- normal circumstances, we, do- we don't trust. Right. We know there's there's some kind of operation going on, and he's a part of it. And you know what? When all the chips are down, he can set his interests aside. And and he and that's it's it's one of my favorite Mayborn episodes is Foothold, where you know he sets his interests aside and he saves Stargate Command, mm-hmm. um, along with Carter and you know some. Of the, and yeah. there was that one scene that got cut where there was a glimmer of hope. <laughs> between Mayborn and Carter. And I think it all fueled that. I think it all fueled where the character went. Oh, that could very well have been. Yeah, yeah. No, they, um, no, no, uh, no. I really, uh, in, in, in that episode, it was, uh, God, I think she likes me. I kind of like her too. But you can't <laughs> let any of that go because you're in a uniform. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Martin Mullet uh, asked, um, "Would uh, Tom? Would you have? And I know there was an Atlantis character that you had auditioned for that you hadn't uh, gotten. But uh, would you have liked to have, have tried your take on another character on SG One? Um, and if there was an existing, was there an existing character that you know you would ever thought, you know what, I would have loved to have tried my hand at that, such as General Hammond, for instance." Um. Well, uh, uh, it's never been part of, I've never entertained any of that. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I do know uh, when I did audition for, um, for the next, uh, the next um, mm-hmm. iteration. Yeah. Uh, that uh, they said, no, you're too recognizable as Mayborn. So we can't have you. Um, mm. uh, and now, you know, given an, another two seasons and going back and auditioning for something, it might have been a, a whole different thing. Um, you know, for X Files, we used to. You know, I've played three different characters on X Files, and they just used us actors because we were actors, and um, and and with all the confidence in the world that uh, the the audience would accept that. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's also a show that ran for what nine seasons or something like yeah. that, something outrageous. Yeah. So. Jen Collin, uh, what do you think King Archon is up to now? <laughs> do you think he has? I, I suspect there's some probably some children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I would imagine. I, I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure he's still happy. I'm sure he's well looked after. Um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, it was, uh, well, I, you could actually, I actually knew that, oh, well, this is the end of Mayborn for this series, (laughs) but it was delightful, absolutely delightful. So, um, no, I, I think, uh, uh, gosh, uh, maybe I should talk to some, some of the old writers to say, if we went back there 20 years later, what would, uh, what, what would, what would he be up to? I would love if if Brad Wright were to do a fourth series, I would love to at the very least have a reference to what happened to him. You know, <laughs> someone checked in on him and you know that I have no doubt that that civilization is prospering <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> uh-huh. Ray Wood 
Uh, does it seem that when Mayborn grew a beard, he was a better person than... It, it does seem that when Mayborn grew a beard, he became a better person than when he was clean shaved. Did they ask you to grow the beard in? Uh, no, I think... Um... I think I had it for something else, uh, some stage thing, when the when the um, when the thing came up, and then it was, uh, do we keep it or don't we? Or maybe I'd grown it for a stage thing and then just decided to keep it. Um, uh, but I also, but I also, it worked because the character was on the lamb. So, Correct. Um, uh, so. I don't know. That was as important for the character that he's on the lamb. He's not the old guy. He's not the guy he was. He's a different guy now. Uh, he seems to be getting a little bit of respect here and there. Um, so um, hmm, I don't know. I know I, I had a, a Facebook, a new Facebook friend the other day from Hungary, or I think it was from Hungary, who was saying he really liked he really liked me with a beard. I should have a beard again. <laughs> <laughs> I liked the beard, you know. Oh, I, I well, I would grow one again. But as you get older, you know, your skin does different things, and uh, right, it, it, they just for me, it's, it gets too flaky, and um, I, I don't mean flaky looking. It gets too flaky, and if I'm wearing dark colors, it's uh, like it's <laughs> like a da it's like dandruff. And oh, no matter, I see what you're saying. And no matter and no matter how much head and shoulders I use. Uh, oh, they need a new brand called cheeks and chins or Aww. something <laughs> so i haven't uh, i haven't had one for many years now tom um i i have had uh the privilege of having so many of you on uh, to discuss stargate from gate world to to dialing home to dial the gate over the years and you know, but there there are a handful of them, uh, of all of you that I uh, consider to be family and friends, and you are absolutely one of them. It has been a privilege to continue to know you, um, and I'm looking forward to catching up with you at GateCon uh, later this year. Well, uh, thanks, David, um, uh, and likewise back. It's always. Uh, great to get your cheerfulness and your positiveness uh you, you always seem to i don't know may, maybe uh, maybe you're not all that positive in life but you certainly get money in your front of the camera or on the phone you are so uh that's good <laughs> you know we've we all had our ups and downs especially over the last yeah. couple of years and yeah. we have to find the things uh that give us joy mm -hmm. and continue to mine that and and yeah. if possible to share that with everyone else and you take yeah. in your time to come on and 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 continue to share memories uh is 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 so rewarding and i'm looking forward to rescued by ruby i'm gonna keep my eyes open for that because uh that that sounds like another another uh, good good ex excuse to enjoy a couple of hours and, and be uplifted. So well, I, I think I think it'll be really a, a, a nice. Uh, it will not be time wasted to watch it. Um, uh, Grant's excellent in it, as uh, a number of others. And uh, I went in and did some ADR, and it looks it was filmed fantastically, just beautifully. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing it, and, um, and I'm sure there's stuff in it that. I, that I'll be surprised by because uh, even though you read the script, you forget uh, <laughs> what's the, the whole story. So I'm looking forward to it a lot. Isn't that the great thing about, about movie and television though, to be teleported away into a place unexpected that you didn't anticipate, you know, yeah. when it, when it, um, when it surprises you. Yeah. Absolutely. Tom, yeah. I, I appreciate your time and uh, uh, we'll be, uh, we'll be catching up in person. Great. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for coming on and uh, we'll be in touch with you. Okay. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me and to everyone out there. La, la, la. Be well, sir. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Tom bye, Macbeth. Summer. Thank you. Tom Macbeth, everyone. Uh, Colonel Mayborn from Stargate.
Dial Gate is brought to you every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching. But if you want to support the show further, buy yourself some of our themed swag. We're now offering t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages, as well as cups and other accessories in a variety of sizes and colors at dialthegate.com. From the merchandise tab, click on a specific design to see what items are being offered. Check out as fast as easy and is easy. You can just use your you can use your credit card or PayPal. Just visit dialthegate.com or scrape to dialthegate.com slash merch. And uh, thanks so much for your support. We know that your time is precious. Richard Dean Anderson is going to be joining Brad Wright on The Companion. So we're going to step out of the way and give you guys a chance to go over there. Uh, the Companion uh, is doing an exclusive between Brad Wright and Rick that was uh, recorded previously but uh, is now uh, going to be available today. So I hope everyone enjoys that. It's going to be great to see uh, Rick um, and uh, see his uh, perspective on you know what he's been doing, his perspective on the character over the past uh, 20 to 25 years, O'Neill, I mean, and uh, go from there. We've got uh, a couple um, characters, uh, characters, actors, who are in the works right now. I'm really, really excited about them. Uh, but I can't announce them just yet who have agreed to come on the show. Next week, Joseph Malazzi is going to be back to share stories of season four of Stargate SG-1, uh, excuse me, of Stargate Atlantis with us. He's going to be with us at 12 p.m. Pacific time on the 29th of January for episode 116. We're going to dive deep into Atlantis uh, season four. That's going to be live. He's going to be here to answer your questions. And uh, we'll go from there. I appreciate you tuning in. Thanks so much to my producer, Linda Gategabber Fury, as well as my moderator, Summer, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy, Reese, Anthony. A big thanks to Frederick Marcoux at Concepts Web. He's our web developer for Dial the Gate. Also, a big thank you to Jeremy Heiner, keeping our website up to date each and every week. My name is David Reed. I really appreciate you uh, tuning in and watching the show. Uh, if you want to continue to see uh, more content like this, please share uh, an episode that you enjoyed with a fellow Stargate fan. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you on the other side. <laughs>